So, welcome to Orang Dayalame. Um, thank you for being here. Orang is the CTO and the co-founder of Extopay, and he's going to speak about off-grid payments and ID. So, without further ado, your floor is yours. Very Back. good. I'll go ahead and um, share my screen. So, okay. When I'm presenting, I don't see the chat window. So, um, if uh, somebody has a question or if there are any issues, uh, it would be great if uh, somebody could let me know with audio. Um, so um, happy to be here and uh, sharing with you uh, a solution we're working on. I'm uh, the co-founder of uh, two startups that are contributing um, to, to the solutions we'll explain. Um, one of them uh, is Exto Labs. Uh, we're building uh, sort of a last mile solution uh, for digital payments and identity. And another one uh, is Ethernum, which is building this biometric smart card, uh, including the semiconductors that enable uh, a compact, uh, sophisticated sort of low cost device. Um, so today I'm going to focus on um, aspects of the system which are really um, unique uh, and that is uh, to do off-grid uh, digital payments. Um, by off-grid we mean uh, if there is no internet connection. Um, I think uh, James earlier in describing the central bank digital currencies, uh, James Daly described that this has become a requirement um, for uh, central banks, uh, it's, it's sort of a mandatory capability and it's a challenging problem to secure value when you don't have access to a network. Um, so we'll try to share with you some of what we're doing. Um, I think um, just to give you an overview of uh, Extopay, uh, this is an open loop payment system we're developing uh, by open loop. We we don't want to create a walled garden type platform um, sort of like um, and allow multiple financial uh, service providers or payment service providers to participate in this and we're building it on a very um, uh, deep set of open source platforms um, and right now we've based a lot of our solutions on um, a fork of ripple and uh, BRD wallets. Um, and we're now um, soon going to be inter integrating with uh, Finteract and Mojo Loop to sort of offer interoperability uh, with other payment systems and offer some uh, core banking capabilities. So the again, the emphasis um, today I want to kind of have is on um, universal access so in digital payments um you know uh, we always focus on uh, mobile uh, and it goes a lot of places but we forget about the fact that um, much of the world <laughs> and, and even in mature economies there is good percentages of people that don't um, have access to smartphones and connectivity is not always reliable everywhere um, so we've relied on card payments in mature economies to get that universality, but um, those are too expensive and too complicated. The transaction fees are not uh, acceptable. So a new form of universal access devices required uh, that can really cater to, to the largest populations. Um, now, if you want to do something that's like cash, um, being able to work offline and without an internet connection becomes a real uh, need. And, um, you know, one has to think about both the wallets for consumers as well as, as what is the point of sale systems that merchants uh, will use. Um, in this system that we've designed, it, it 
almost required us to have a built-in digital identity. Uh, we use it for, uh, aside from the fact that there's compliance issues we needed to address um, so for the security of the offline system, we rely on this uh, digital identity with verifiable credentials. So these are the topics on RED that I will focus on. There are, there are other aspects of the system, but, but my main focus will be on these topics. So, you know, drilling a little bit again into this need for uh, offline payments. So we, we've been focused before even CBDC showed up for, for the past several years on really addressing this gap that we see in emerging uh, markets. Uh, even though mobile money has been exceptionally successful, now over a billion mobile money accounts, um, you know, hundreds of mobile money service providers, sort of this gig economy with money agents uh, enabling unbanked users to cash in and cash out, uh, and the transaction volumes are becoming impressive. But this is only, you know, 10 to 20 percent of the transactions uh, in many of these emerging countries markets and still 90 percent of the transactions are in cash um, a lot of consumers still lack smartphones um, you know uh, the governor of bank of japan was saying that even in japan 30 percent of their population doesn't have a smartphone you know if you're elderly alike so it's not a, you know, in, in emerging economies, even though $50 smartphones have been around now for a few years, it's a very slow adoption. So, and then there is uh, connectivity issues. A lot of consumers don't have access to connectivity. And, um, you know, as a result, you know, results, not just these, you know, billions of people are not getting access to digital payments. So there's a real need to be able to do off-grid digital payments when there's no internet connectivity. Uh, again, this is very challenging. Uh, there were attempts at this in the 90s with Mondex and others, but you know, one needs a very low cost universal access device uh, that requires very compact designs, uh, packing a lot of technology into sort of, uh, and it essentially requires, you know, it's, it's next to impossible to do it with off the shelf semiconductors in a scalable way. So you need to do uh, custom low power electronics for it. But securing offline value and ways to recover it um, are some of the, you know, big question marks um, that, that need to be addressed. Um, so, you know, I, I'll go back to the CBDC world because uh, while we were working on this sort of blue ocean of offline, um, you know, uh, most of the commercial entities are focused where mobile is and they don't worry about where it's not. Uh, but central banks can't do that. If they're issuing a you know, sovereign digital currency, it has to be universally accessible. And uh, we see those requirements now from all the central banks. Uh, the CBDC uh, efforts are uh, gaining momentum. They're still slow, but but there has been a lot of trials. There's a few, again, James talked about this, you know, uh, China is in uh, sort of pilot slash rollout mode. Uh, we've seen in this, their Caribbean, an actual system launched. And in all of these settings, this offline capability still remains a challenge to be addressed. And, uh, and you know what we see right now is a acceleration of of uh, you know uh, what the central banks are doing and again I'll, I'll get into too much of this i think james uh, daly's presentation described the the trends in this market but kind of what's important is that a lot of stakeholders have spoken so uh, you'll find a bank of international settlements report that gathered the essential requirements from many of the central banks who've been experimenting and recently, uh, the Monetary Authority of Singapore had a global CBDC challenge with a lot of the stakeholders, again, uh, the World Bank, IMF, Asian Development Bank, many of the financial inclusion um, interested parties like the UN parties that you see here uh, sort of have partnered with them. And um, we were one of the, our team was one of the teams selected uh, as one of the 15 fil finalists. So the system that you'll see us describe here that we're building, um, you know, has uh, addressed a number of uh, problem statements that, that these banks are identifying. Again, we're focusing on the, the, the 
top four <laughs> blocks that you see in green. So, you know, how do you address users without smartphones? Uh, how do you secure this system, still keep it accessible for low literacy or elderly or, um, you know, uh, in terms of that type of accessibility? Can uh, there be payments without internet? Um, how do you recover lost funds for these type of offline value? Um, and um, so I won't get into the other problem statements, but just focusing on these, um, our answer to this was uh, this Exto Pay system that we're building. Uh, it includes uh, a smart card, which you'll see uh, soon in a video, as well as mobile wallets. These act both as wallets for the consumers as well as point of sale devices. So we've kind of democratized. It's not that, that um, card to big brick POS uh, with a lot of intermediaries to enable that. We're really kind of turning this card into a equivalent of a wallet that can secure, you know, secure transactions and talk to any other device, uh, whether it's a smartphone or another card. And therefore, we use Bluetooth and QR codes as a means of doing transactions between these devices, because that's the ideal, um, you know, sort of uh, communication that would let you talk to every phone. And you know, NFC is there. We have an NFC capability, but not every phone supports that. So we'll we'll talk a little bit about these wallets. Um, we we've gone with a distributed ledger backend for multiple reasons. Uh, this is a permissioned um, distributed ledger that's meant to be operated by a financial service provider uh, and you know um, and payment service providers. It um, distributed ledgers do some very interesting things if you want to really lower costs of transactions. They first of all they push the security to the edge where the cryptography and the keys are in the wallets. So that if you design it properly and if you have multi-factor authentication and secure sort of devices in the wallets, they solve a lot of the account takeover problems that cause significant fraud and leakage in typical payment systems. Um, and that's why, you know, a lot of the, you know, we see the half a percent to two, three percent merchant transaction fees. So the key management uh, inherent in uh, distributed ledgers kind of solves that problem. But also the distributed ledgers themselves allow for resilience. Um, you know, in our architecture, we're um, creating private distributed ledgers um, that individual uh, institutions can operate. But we also allow um, essentially uh, inter-ledger transactions that allows, uh, you know, creates kind of an open loop network, uh, similar to what Visa and MasterCard have, where multiple institutions can, can interact. You know, if you have a merchant acquired by one entity and a consumer, you know, has been issued a card, you know, or an account by another entity, these two parties can interact. And with a distributed ledger architecture, you remove a number of intermediaries, you know, switch operators, different aggregators, uh, uh, POS players, a, a lot of that, um, you know, players in that equation uh, are eliminated. There are scalability issues uh, that need to be addressed, which we'll talk about. And there are um, sort of um, uh, issues with, um, you know, keeping the uh, privacy PII information, you know, um, and, and providing user control uh, while at the same time you're addressing compliance issues. Um, so the, I'll show you a quick video here. Um, hopefully, you will all be able to hear it. The Exto cards provide a tamper resistant secure element on card private fingerprint recognition and e ink display and navigation touch wheel, Bluetooth, NFC, and USB connectivity. The user simply sets up the card by providing 10 samples of their fingerprints. These are stored privately on the card and used for multi-factor authentication in combination with private keys. As a backup, 
out, the user is provided the option to provide a PIN. This PIN is only used in case the fingerprints are injured and the user cannot access the card through fingerprint. So now we'll show how the agent onboards a new customer. Hit activate, click the customer's photo. Enter their name, possibly check their ID, it's done. Then we scan their card, it connects to the card. Now it waits for the agent card, has to approve it. And now it's pushing the identity information to the customer card. And now she's ready to go, uh, except she doesn't have any money on her, her card. I can send her some funds. To approve it on my card. And now we're done. I open my wallet, choose receive, enter an amount, hit request, scan the card, wait for it to connect. Now waiting for the card owner to say okay. And now we're confirming it with the back end. Finalizing with the card. Now the payment's complete. Okay, now we'll show a phone to card payment. Uh, power up the card, authenticate myself, and then it shows a QR code which will be used to establish a secure Bluetooth connection. Now on the phone side, I enter send, choose an amount, scan the QR code, Sets up a secure, checks my balance. Now it's waiting for my phone card to agree. This card signs the transaction, authorizing the phone to send the funds to the other card. So if someone had my phone alone, they can receive money to it, but they can't send money without the matching card. And then it shows on the receiving side that he's received $14. Now we'll demonstrate a card to phone payment when the phone is offline and I've set up this phone um, so it can't talk to the, the back end. I authenticate on the card, shows the QR code now on the phone. I choose receive, $10, request, scan the card uses the QR code to establish a secure Bluetooth connection. I agree to pay and the payment's complete. Now, okay, so we open our wallet, hit receive. And now if I wanna uh, check the card holder's identity, I hit the ID button, scan their card. Now it's requesting a photo that's been saved on the card when it was opened with the bank. And now I can compare authorized user with the person there. They look good. I can go ahead with the request. And then they approve. All right, that was Now we'll show an offline card to card transaction. I choose card to card and I will receive. Now I enter an amount, let's say $21. Oops. Okay. Looks to connect to the card over Bluetooth. And now we compare these codes, make sure they're the same. That proves that we're talking to each other. We both agree. And now I 
I agree to accept this payment that's going to exp expire in a week. And they agree to send. And payment's complete. So we open up the e-ticket app. And we have all of our... Okay, so you get a sense of um, what um, we're able to do with this system. Um, hopefully <laughs> the audio and video was playing. Um, I, I didn't see any uh, complaints, but um, uh, just going on uh, with this, um, the, the um, you know, I'm focusing on, again, we have mobile wallets, but uh, that the, one of the instruments needed to enable uh, the type of offline payment you saw last in that video uh, is an instrument like this type of a smart card that you know you, you saw in action. And uh, you know what what we have is a biometric sensor, a secure display. Um, we, we've effectively you know a secure enclave with uh, cryptography that allows uh, the type of signatures that distributed ledgers need. Uh, a way of interacting, uh, and then, you know, connectivity, Bluetooth, NFC, and alike. And this, what this does is it allows you to bring in the security of a point of sale system effectively into every card so that the transactions that come out of this card are, um, you know, secure, just like if you were doing a Bitcoin transaction. Everyone can see those transactions, but only the recipients with the private keys of those accounts could really unlock the value. So, that allows us a lot of uh, ability to to pass these transactions through unsecured devices, and that's the half online, uh, half offline, or half online mode. In the full offline mode, we keep a small ledger in the secure enclave of the card, and then try to use semiconductor defenses to protect that um, uh, that uh, amount that's uh, stored on the card, but and avoid double spends. Uh, but, you know, we're semiconductor experts and we know that uh, th that these accounts can be hacked. If there's a lot of value sitting offline, uh, you know, you can spend a lot of resources to to, you know, invasively get credentials out of chips, in which case you need to make sure the whole system doesn't come down. So it becomes a strategies have to be used to uh, make sure you can disable accounts. Um, you um, you know, we came up with this notion of an expiring currency so that we would get people to come back to the network and report their transactions. And uh, therefore, if any card was attacked and double spending, we could detect it and then propagate a block list to others so that the honeypot would be limited. Uh, and then the verifiable credentials and the ID becomes a way to make sure that a counterfeit card you know, that that's not issued for the person is not being used because one of the attack vectors will be producing, you know, uh, hacking my account and then producing, you know, 10,000, you know, uh, uh, counterfeit cards that can go and pretend they're me extracting value from offline users. And that can be protected with with the verifiable credentials. So. Our overall system involves uh, agent solutions that can onboard people very easily, load value, cash in, cash out through agents or through banking APIs. There is a distributed ledger, a hierarchical distributed ledger. We use these methods of securing the offline uh, transactions that I described. And um, you know, really, <clears throat> this kind of a design and you know, the, the edge-based cryptography can reduce um, a lot of the fraud that happens typically in systems like this. So the notion of combining biometrics and uh, multi-factor authentication uh, with this private key that's in the cards uh, really secures the, the you know, 90, 95% of the account takeovers. And that leads to an, a situation where one can have a sustainably low transaction system and migrate the value to elsewhere in, in the financial services that are enabled. Um, just a little bit about the integration work we're doing. This is kind of an overview of the system. We have our wallets. We have our agent apps. 
we use sort of a heterogeneous sources of data for onboarding people before we stamp the verifiable credential IDs into the cards. These can be photo IDs, uh, national databases, uh, in some markets, SMS uh, IDs have been made available or banking you know, uh, identities. Um, all of those can be brought in. Uh, we have the backend system that manages our, you know, ledger and payment transactions. And we are integrating with Finteract um, and we're basically trying to handle our account uh, creation, KYC databases, account orchestration, you know, through MIFOS Finteract initially. Um, uh, but uh, we're also interested in Mojaloop in order to get interoperability with other payment systems. Um, we are a second tier payment solution. So the actual minting of CBDCs and wholesale transactions, you know, uh, RTGS like functionality or cross border happens with other systems. But these systems like R3 Corda or Hyperledger, but these systems aren't um, scalable and they don't handle the features that you need to, to, to do uh, offline payments and, um, you know, s some of the uh features that are needed in a retail uh you know scenario um i think uh, it's very important for these systems to be open loop so um you know what you see here is that we can essentially run instances like this for different financial service providers or payment providers and uh, um, that's one of the big attributes that we've gotten away as mobile money has come out Everything is a walled garden, <laughs> which is an app, or and that that's creating um, a lot of data monopolies and winner takes all type scenarios that um, don't work well uh, for consumers. One of the fundamental attributes of the system, also we're trying to address, is this balance between data, you know, and pri you know compliance and privacy. And um, I think at the heart of that is the digital identity system that we've built into this. So. You know, essentially, we're using verifiable credentials. We use, you know, ground truth when people are onboarded. But, um, you know, the the uh, uh, users carry their identity and they can share pieces of it with who they need to. The payment service provider, the financial institutions can know all of these. But what we're trying to do is allow, not allow counterparties to collect information uh, on users and put that in the control of the users. So uh, the compliance, you know, KYC, AML, CFD is addressed, but we're trying to balance it with the user deciding who they can share it with and, and then not allowing those, you know, recipients, those counterparties to collect that information. Um, just to wrap it up, almost most of the system is open and we will put our software out in an open source fashion too as soon as it stabilizes. Um, but the hardware here also needs to be open. And when it comes to hardware, uh, you can't uh, do this with you know open source methods. It really has to be an open standard. So this hardware needs something like EMV to ensure <laughs> sort of standardization and interoperability, but it needs to be uh, accessible to many, many suppliers. So it has to have a non-discriminatory licensing of IP associated with it, kind of like Wi-Fi is when you, uh, that standard allows people to go make Wi-Fi chips and they can meet the interoperability requirements of the Mac and the communication layers and so on and so forth, uh, that's, you know, even RF, you know, through through interface standards. So uh, we, um, in, I don't know when this will happen. <laughs> it's early in the days of, you know, digital currencies, but we're going to advocate for an open uh, standard here as well. So with that, I'm gonna stop and uh, hopefully um, if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Okay, uh, so there's a question about uh, cost. So the, the, the cost of these cards need to be in the, you know, right now our smart cards cost about two, three dollars. And obviously these cards pack more functionality on them, but the costs, you know, need to be something between four to $10 uh, 
in volume and that's achievable but it does require um, a custom you know semiconductor not just for cost but also for power and for security so initially the costs are going to be in the you know north of ten dollars fifteen dollars range but if the same volumes of normal cards appear and if the right uh, optimizations happen there's no reason that this this these cards can be you know extremely low cost but given that the transaction revenues can be lowered in this type of a system um, easily that you know when that half a percent to two three percent is gone uh, there needs to be um, a uh, you know that easily makes up for the extra cards of the cost even today um, battery so there's a question about do they need batteries so the current cards we have are rechargeable um, so they last about a few months because we're we, in our first generations we're using off-the-shelf uh, semiconductors but we have been designing in parallel a uh, uh, ultra low power soc that will extend the life to two years plus um, we are doing energy harvesting um, in that version um, so a slightly thicker version of the card that wouldn't be compliant with emv can have replaceable batteries in it um, so that's that's the power is a big issue we, we need to make it for the if it's mass product we want to make it so that people don't know any difference between this and normal cards um, is there an sdk um, yes we're trying to develop sdks and apis but we're still early in our completing the system the mvp and um, we'll get to that phase to open this up to uh, uh, third parties mm -hmm. uh, yeah so the, the manufacturing and scalability of this is extremely difficult this is um, you know this compact <laughs> type of form factor has been is a very challenging environment for um, achieving scalability and that's why i keep talking about um, the single soc the secure enclave in this type of a card needs to subsume bluetooth needs to bring in very complex crypto engines including zero knowledge proof engines that are very computationally intensive it has an image processing problem with the fingerprint recognition uh, you have to deal with special electronics to drive the displays so all of these need to be put into a single soc and done not in firmware you cannot get the power that you need in, if you implement these things in firmware so there has to be a parallelization and you know implementation in uh, dedicated gates along with a processor but you don't want to do the heavy computation so uh, those are the types of um, uh, efforts that are required to get the manufacturing of these in scale. Very good. Um, I'm trying to read through um, the questions anymore. Uh, oh, is there a pilot uh, in place? So we are, um, we, we've been doing uh, testing um, in small scale, but we are focused in uh, East Africa and in India and we have uh, actual financial partners lining up that we'll be doing pilots with um, a few you know we are part of the mass project that will go into a proof of concept phase um, you know uh, next so so you guys are getting an early peek into this and um, again we, we're lucky to have a number of uh, key personnel from uh, Finneract as part of our team so James Daly, um, uh, Istvan, um, um, uh, Ed Cable, I'm probably forgetting sort of names here, but we're, we're very lucky to have uh, you know, them participating. So we will work very closely with, uh, with the community and hopefully um, um, share uh, the platform and results uh, with you. Um, So let's see, uh, there is a question. Bulgarda, a few seconds ago, Algo's way could use a simulator of that smart card. Um, yeah, as far as a phone simulator, we started like that, uh, but now um, 
we have the cards and when you're on a phone um uh, yeah so so we we've moved you know our resources are limited so all of our focus has been on the card itself and um, we haven't really kept up that early simulator we had in the early days uh, otherwise that would be a good tool to share with everyone that doesn't have access to the hardware uh, we'll have to come back to that in any case i'm uh, uh, available for any questions uh, after this session or if any of you have interests uh, my um, email i'll put it down here so feel free to reach out and um, we'll share uh, what we can with you so javier um, do i we still have time i guess left in this maybe i finished early correct <laughs> Yes, um, we have uh, 10 more minutes or 13 more okay. minutes. All right, so then I can talk a little bit about our interest in Fenner Act, uh, maybe without um, any slides. So we're very interested in um, Fenner Act uh, CN. Um, the, we, yeah. There is a question from Ed. It was. Mm -hmm. Um, oh, sorry. What uh -huh. usability testing have you done with the car in the field, especially with users at the base of the pyramid? Right. So we have um, launched two other applications of the car that have gone in the hands of, I would say, about 2,000 people. Uh, one of them, so they were not this payment scenario, but one of them was a secure online access uh, solution called BeamU. Um, and we did a Kickstarter on this and several thousand people uh, got the cards and we, we were kind of doing a FIDO U2F authentication and a password vault. Um, and um, that uh, ended up really showing us usability issues for, for users. And we kind of built confidence that the cards could be mass produced. Uh, we then created a crypto wallet um, of use version of this card. Um, you'll find that on extowallet.com. And we did test with a, another group of uh, users. And that was really very similar to this wallet use. And I was using our, you know, that that's basically what turned into Extopay, except instead of tying to this other network that we were showing you, we were tied to the public crypto network. So we were, you know, it was a Bitcoin and Ethereum and ERC-20 tokens and whatnot. So in that setting, uh, we saw, uh, saw it in action with users. And that's where, let's say, the issue of recovery was very obvious. You know, this notion of writing down 24 passphrase, you know, to recover your wallet is not a feasible thing in a real payment use case. So we had to come up with ways of uh, having a recovery account um, and and you know means of um, knowing that who that account you know this is these are very strange systems because when you push the key generation into the wallet you don't really the back end kind of doesn't know <laughs> about where the account was created so when you lose that wallet you know how do you recover it so we you know we've addressed those types of issues that we learned in the crypto wallet scenario so those were the places Ed that we've done partial system testing so the actual payment use case the video was showing it to be more complex that is but we put a lot of effort and if you paid attention to what the payer was doing it was no more difficult than a credit card payment they were mm -hmm. basically presenting you know turning on the card pressing a fingerprint then a qr code would appear the merchant was scanning it and the payer was saying okay to an amount that they would see on their screen so it's very much the same steps in a in a normal payment which is you know a qr code scan and then approval of the payment so we've tried to make it extremely simple for the for the users um, you know so that even an elderly person almost like myself can use it but the um the on the other side uh, there is obviously you know, somebody has to enter the amount that you require, and um, that uh, that is what it is. You know, so so there is, a, but there's an author audience phenomena here. Um, you know, where um, somebody can do that work of it's either the merchant or in a peer-to-peer. -peer 
targeting someone who knows how to enter the amounts, and then the recipient only does a very simple, tra you know, transaction. So uh, we're we're getting pretty good results in early evaluations by in-house kind of uh, consumer tests. We haven't still gone out to a larger market. I'm sure we'll have many many issues to address uh, in the real world. So. Okay. Okay. Great. Yeah. So, so again, just to tie it back to to the Finteract uh, community, for us, uh, th there are uh, some basic account creation, KYC, account orchestration needs, and this is what allows us to really work with Finteract CN and try to take advantage of this uh, sort of future direction that you know, um, you know, where scalability and other issues can be addressed. Um, so we're, you know, um, relying on the guidance of uh, um, any of your sort of uh, team members to to help us uh, build that type of integration together. And uh, we think that a payment system that can reach larger populations in these emerging markets and be disruptive in terms of that transaction fee is going to be a very uh, important tool to uh, bring people to financial services and ultimately it's through those financial services that the system needs to be monetized so you know credit worthiness data will come from these type of payment systems and loan origination you know what what banks and financial institutions do can be satisfied that's one of our reasons to be interested in Finteract as well that we ultimately see data generated from a payment system like this that can be exploited in the type of financial services that Finteract enables. Great, awesome. Very interesting. Thank you and uh, good luck. Uh, pleasure to meet everyone. Um, we have the next session in seven minutes. So uh, I'll sign off. And, uh, leading edge again, anyone... engineering behavior. And Okay, uh, we can. We 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 are waiting for the results of your of your first pilots. <laughs> Very good. Let us know on the list and and anything that the community can help. I think that many many of us will jump into this. It looks very interesting. Yeah, we look forward to it. So thank you very much and talk soon. Bye bye, bye everyone. Bye bye. bye.